Hello and welcome to the 10 Plus Club, where I speak to business owners and entrepreneurs about how they've managed to run a business for more than 10 years. Longevity is the key. And in this case, Cheryl White from Apollo Care has been successfully running her own business since 2000. And eleven, and I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted to welcome Cheryl to the Ten Plus Club and her business Apollo Care. Hello, Cheryl. How are you? Hi, Marcus. I'm great, thank you. Really good. Now, quickly tell us what does Apollo Care do as a business concept. So, what Apollo Care does, Marcus, is we provide home care to vulnerable people who are living in their own homes to keep them in their own homes independently for as long as possible. So effectively, you are supplying uh, a team of professionals. I imagine they're mostly nurses. Is that right? They're not nurses. No, they're qualified carers. So they're, co- they're, they're assistants, caring assistants. And we go out and we deliver personal care, shopping, medication prompts, all of the things that people need to stay in their own homes. I see. So effectively, you're providing a service to help people still be independent within their own homes. And yes. and that's as that is an all that I imagine that is a growing sector, is it not? Yeah, yeah, it is a growing sector. Um, again, I started the business 13 years ago. At the time, I was working as a district nurse and um, palliative care nurse out on the community and realized that there was a real need for good home care providers who provided that high quality of care. And how how many people do you sort of indirectly employ in this manner? Uh, hundreds of care staff. Um, my franchisees employ the carers directly, um, but there's probably what, way over 800, probably near to 1,000 care staff out working for Apollo Care today. That's incredible. And you've you've really, I mean, I talk to a lot of business owners about whether they expand the business or keep the business sort of on a smaller operation footing. Uh, and you've really taken the decision to expand the service uh, at, via franchising. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Yeah. So we when I started the business, the business grew very, very quickly. And I came to a crossroads of what do I want to do with this business? Do I want to continue with it? Um, do I want to sell it? Or do I want to expand? So I was looking at all of the different options. And my accountant at the time recommended franchising. Had a little look at it and thought, yeah, that was definitely the route I wanted to go down. Now, I'm fascinated because I think this will resonate with a lot of business owners on businesses who watch the businessesforsale.com uh, podcasts and content a lot of people come to businessesforsale.com with the same concept do i sell the business or do i expand it now i'm interested to know what was the bit what did the business look like before you made that decision to franchise was it really just you and a handful of people providing the service what was the kind of structure of the business were you just effectively like a sole trader or a small company doing this with limited numbers because i think it's really important for people watching this to understand that they can dramatically change the shape of their business when they decide to franchise so i'm really interested to know what was your business like at that point when you're thinking, do I sell the business? Do I expand the business? What did your business look like back in sort of uh, 2011 before you franchised? So the business had been running for just over 18 months when I took the decision to franchise it. Um, the, I had a, a head office team of four people, including me, and we had around about 35 care staff at that point. Turnover of around 22,000 a month. Uh, So the business was growing, everything was going great. But we were getting calls from literally all over Merseyside at that time saying, can you help us with our parents? Can you help me with my clients? All all of the things. And we we were literally at full capacity at that point. 
Um, I knew I didn't want to expand the business anymore on my own because I was a full capacity. I had children. I was run, you know, doing doing all of the things that mums do. Still nursing a couple of days a week because I loved nursing and had this business that was growing and growing. So I had to make a decision then. Um, I knew the business was too good to cap it at that sort of you know small rate. So I thought, well, I can hand it over to somebody else who, who's got that vision and wants to grow it more, or I do that myself, but remove myself from the day-to-day running and I, I concentrate on the brands, the expansion, the the operations, the systems. So that's what really appealed to me about franchising. And one of the big challenges of franchising is, I mean, what you what you obviously created before you franchised was a successful business based on the core values that you embody as a carer and mm-hmm. and how that sort of uh sort of bled into all the other people that you em- employed they were how do you know the big question is how do you go from a setup like that that's like employing 30 odd people turning over 20 to 25,000 a month to then employing 800 or so people indirectly through a franchise network how do you retain the quality of service when you make that kind of expansion as a business owner? What What, what is your advice? I think it's growing in stages, Marcus. So I think you've got to be, if, you, if you're going to grow a business, you've got to be planning for that growth. You know, you can't just suddenly think, well, I'm going to franchise my business and then I'm going to sell X amount of franchise. You know, you need to really plan that and then work backwards from that. Something that I do consistently within Apollo Um finding the right people to work with as well to help you to grow that business. So again, when I franchised Apollo Care, I had a really tough time with my franchise consultant. They disappeared. They didn't, you know, they didn't help and all of the things. And I had to go and source other other avenues to be able to then franchise that business to make sure that we had the correct legal documents in place, um, marketing tea, all, all of the things that you need within that business. So I think two, two, real key areas to what you've said so it's finding the right people to help you to move forwards with that and to help you understand what that looks like but then also to get that operational excellence in there as well so not just growth look at where you are now how you can improve and then how you can sort of push that going forwards how many um franchise uh, offices do you currently have in the uk at the moment, we have 15 in the UK and we're ready to sign our first international license in South Africa um, as a master license. We've got a growth plan in place um, where we want to expand our reach to 45 franchises within the next five years. So we think that's a really steady growth rate. It will enable us to slowly grow our team, but we feel like now We've done lots of work in the last 12 months to get the business operationally sound, the systems right, so that then we can support franchisees further afield. And when you're franchising abroad, did you experience the same kind of problems when you were initially franchising here in the UK, which is what you allude to, which is finding the right advisors, finding the best advice, finding the best consultants to do that? How have you managed to do that internationally does it require a different kind of franchise consultant to help you expand abroad yeah it's a different skill set and luckily Marcus now because I've had the business for 10 years I've got an amazing team around me with Apollo not just the people I employ but our associated experts so I've got the best lawyers um the best accountants you know so they came in and they helped me to do that um, I've now got lawyers in the country that I'm franchising in and they wrote the agreement with my UK lawyers. So I've got all of the right people around me now to help me with that growth. Uh, Cheryl, when you started out as a carer, how old were you? 14, I read on your website, 14 yeah. years ago. So I started working in care when I was just 14. I was in my um, second to last year in school and I got a job of a, of a Saturday afternoon in a local residential home. Did you ever imagine, Cheryl, as a 14-year-old girl back then, if you could have projected to the future, that you would be building this extraordinary network that employs many hundreds of carers and now looking to expand 
overseas. Did you ever imagine that would have, did, did the 14 year old Cheryl ever see that? No, absolutely not. No, the 14 year old Cheryl was working for £2.30 an hour and was just delighted to be able to buy some new clothes, to buy a magazine of a Saturday. It was all thinking about what's going to happen the next day. I never dreamt in a million years that that would be the path that I would go down. I always knew I wanted to be a nurse. That was always in me to do. And I then went on to qualify as a nurse um, in, in the year 2000. But absolutely not. I think, you know, if you'd have told me 15 years ago that this was where I'd be now, I would have just laughed and said, I just, I wouldn't have done that. Even 15 years ago? <laughs> Even 15, when I was working as a nurse, I've got no business ex background, no business experience, none of my family are business owners. It was just something I went into and I literally learned as I went along, um, which does surprise some people because they, you know, when I do talk to other people, they'll say, well, where did you learn how to do this? I learned from experience. That's the only way I did it. So, I mean, I find it always fascinating how, you know, you come across people that all they want to do is be in business and own a business and run a business. And it's it's sometimes, you know, really they're 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 not great stories. They're they're often up and down. Here you seem to have hit the ground running and you come across even in this brief conversation as someone that really understands how to plan that i think the key words you talked about the key messaging that you talked about just now was about surrounding yourself with good people and i think really at the heart of it a good entrepreneur or good business person knows their limitations and understands that they need to get the help in would you say that is where you're coming from as a business yeah, owner. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think you're only as strong, Marcus, as the people around you. The people you surround yourself with are going to be the people who propel you to that next level. That's why I love franchising so much because when our franchisees come into us, potential franchisees who want to be awarded an Apollo franchise, when we speak to them, we say to them, you know, you're coming into a business where you are going to be surrounded by the best team in the care and in the franchise industry, in my opinion. So they're already coming in with that team behind them, that support, that planning system so that they're ready to take their business, you know, wherever they want to take it with the support of the Apollo team. And when you're recruiting franchisees, what are the qualities that you're looking in these in, in the people that join your network? Because that is a crucial decision isn't it like yeah. getting that right if it, it's it's almost more important than getting an a, a, when you're employing a person because if that doesn't work out it's not the end of the world they can move on to another job you you know there can be uh, a, a sort of it can be just written down as a mistake for both parties but when 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 the franchisee is wrong it's it's a much big has a bigger impact on the business so how do you get that right what are you looking for when you're recruiting franchisees first and foremost Marcus they need to care and I know it sounds a cliche in a care company but they really need to have that passion behind them of why do you want to start a business so we get people applying from all different walks of life so they could have a, a background in health and social care and they've they're currently working with a care provider and they feel like their wings have been clipped a little bit. They've got all of these ideas and they're, they're not able to express them or to, to make them come to, you know, into reality. Or we get investors, so people who have made money in business and they now want to give back to the local communities and they will buy into a, into a care franchise to be able to make that difference. So at the heart of the success of your business and at the heart of the success of you franchising this business is your understanding of what it means to be a carer, which yeah. goes back to the 14 year old Cheryl all the way absolutely. back. Absolutely. Yeah. And do you know what, Marcus, you've, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head of what we are. So I was talking at the care show yesterday in Birmingham and somebody asked me what makes our franchise different from all the other care franchises out there. And it's our experience. We've been there and we've literally, I've grown this business from the ground up. 
I know what it is to be a carer. I know what it is to be a nurse. I know what it is to be a brand new business owner. I know all of the things that that has built up to this moment. Still very involved in the business. Um, and it's that that makes us so different from others. And I'm interested to know, like, when success comes to you as a business owner, um, does your life change? Does the car get upgraded? Do you go on bigger holidays? Um, what's your what's your relationship with material success? I'm always fascinated to know how business owners respond to that part of their life. Yeah, I think it's been sensible, isn't it? You know, I, I always invest a lot of the profits back into the business. Um, I've always done that, and that's how we've been able to grow the way we have. Um, obviously, you know, I've got a new house since I was a nurse. We've upgraded the house. I've just bought a new car last week, and I love Audis. They're my favourite things. Um, but for me, more than any materialistic thing, it's time. I've got two boys, one's 16 and one's nine. Um, both football mad ones just started playing for Everton full time. So he's all over the place. Um, so what it does for me as a business owner is it gives me that freedom of time. I can organise my own day. I've got the most amazing team who literally, you know, I don't even have to ask them. They just know what I need from them now. Um, and the material stuff's great. You know, we're going to Florida on Friday. The fact we're, we're doing all sorts of things. And that's lovely, and I'll always appreciate that and be forever grateful for it. But for me, it's picking William up from school today at three o'clock. It's taking Dan to his football game tomorrow morning and not having to go out and nurse and do shifts on the wards. It's that for me that really makes it special. I it's music to my ear, Cheryl. You're, you know, you're, you're so investable as an entrepreneur because of everything that you've said that you've got your feet on the ground you know what it is that you want to provide as a service your priority is reinvestment into the business yeah. and the benefits that you get from it are the bonus as it were yeah. and and it's and it's very rare in business to have that that's why you're investable i think because Normally, it's the other way around. You've got people in business who prioritize the car. They prioritize the big house. They prioritize the lifestyle and the holidays. And then the business that they end up doing or running is supporting that. But you are a true entrepreneur. You're driven by the business. You're driven by the business's success. And all the other things that come are just a bonus. And uh, I uh, one final question: Are you all an Everton family, or is there any Liverpool in there as well? Yeah, well, a hundred percent Liverpool through and through. So Dan is Liverpool mad, bedroom Liverpool, everything Liverpool, but he was chosen by Everton, so that's where he's gone. So now, do, do the, all the colours change in the house, or are no. you no? Absolutely not. No. There's going to be a little bit of trouble there, maybe. The Everton share comes off when he comes home, and the Liverpool one gets put on. <laughs> Wonderful. Cheryl, what an absolute joy and a pleasure to speak to you today. It's a really inspirational conversation and something that will resonate with a lot of business owners that follow us on businessesforsale.com. And I can't wait to meet you in person one day at one of these exhibitions. Thanks, Marcus. It was really, really lovely to meet you. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Bye. Bye.